All right. Well, I'm a wreck right now, so we'll see how it goes. I figured I'd fulfill some promises today and preach with my mom. What do you guys think about that? All right. This sign right here is inspiring. I am super amped about it right here. It is awesome. You should have seen it when we first got it in. We were going for this like metal look. And it was the chintziest looking vinyl overlay that you would ever see on a sign in our, in our entire life when they pulled this thing out of the box. It was hilarious. It was honestly kind of funny. And so they uh, ended up coming up with some slick solutions and came up with this sweet looking sign. So it's pretty cool. It is pretty cool. All right. So, gosh, I don't even know how to start this. Worship was unreal. Okay. Where do we want to go? All right. So I've been thinking a lot about belief systems lately in life, just about the, the things that, that we believe about ourselves and the things that we believe about God. And I'm thinking about just people's lives and what they do with their lives and stuff. And, and really to get to know people, oftentimes we say, hey, what did you do this week? What did you do this last year? We tell stories about our life. But I think we could really find out the way that people live their life by asking one question. And that's what do you believe? And finding out what, what type of belief systems do you carry? What do you believe about your relationships that you have? What do you believe about your marriage? What do you believe about Jesus? What do you believe about him, who he really is, right? What do you believe about God? Is he a loving father? Is he this mean man in the sky? What do you believe? I'll find a lot about your Christian walk just through that question. What do you believe about work? Do you believe there's actually purpose for you to be there? Do you believe that you bring the kingdom of heaven into your workplace? Do you believe that it's pointless for you to work? And I'll find out about your, your work life very easily, very quickly. I could pretty much sum up everything about your life by just asking what you believe about it. What you believe about yourself, what do you believe about the things that you do? So all beliefs are based upon one of two things. It's either truth, it lines up with the kingdom of heaven, it lines up with what Jesus said, what he put forth, it lines up with him as the word of God, or it's a lie. There's, there's not really any middle ground to play with in, in our belief systems. There is truth and there's not truth, and there's half-truths, which half-truths aren't even truth. They're a lie, right? Is this making sense? Yeah. So what we believe will dictate our actions that we do in life. But now it's not the other way around. Our actions don't necessarily dictate what our beliefs are. So I could ask somebody, hey, uh, you, I saw that you went out and you prayed for the sick and you had this deep desire to go out and bring, bring healing to somebody. Why? Do, because do you believe that God is a loving daddy? Do you believe that he's a father that wants to bring good things to his children? Or are you fearful that if you don't perform for him, then he's going to be mad at you? So our actions, we can, we can do the same action, but it can have two different belief systems behind it. Does that make sense? And so what I'm afraid of and what has happened in Christianity is we focus a lot on our actions. We focus a lot on what you need to do and what you do not need to do, but not necessarily about why. What's the belief system behind this and the way that you live life? Is it because of Jesus? Is it because you're full of fear? Is it because you do love God and you desire to see him be loved? And so belief systems are really at the core of what it is that we need to focus on in the Christian life. Right? Isn't it, isn't it that the Holy Spirit revealed truth to us? He revealed a new belief system for us, something greater to believe in. He comes in and he renews our mind. He didn't just tell us, do this and do that, and then Jesus is going to save you. Actually, righteousness is only based on belief. There's absolutely nothing else that you can do, good or bad, that will change your standing in Christ. Your righteousness is actually only based upon your belief system. And it's that Jesus is the son of God. That I believe in Jesus Christ. I believe that he's the only way. He's the truth and the life. That he sent his spirit to dwell within me. And that's it. There's, there's nothing else. That's really the only thing. Nothing that I do really changes that. But oftentimes we try to dictate our beliefs by our behavior. Instead of focusing on our beliefs and having our behavior follow. And so that's what I want to talk about this morning is we've kind of established here. Even Jesus says it. Let's turn to John 6. Let 
Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. There we go. All right. I'm there. Hey, can I get a little bit more of my voice over here? Okay, so John 6, 28 says this. Then they said to him, what shall we do that we may work the works of God? Jesus then responds, you need to stand on your head, pray for nine hours. No, oh no. He actually says, this is the work of God, that you believe him, whom he sent. So Jesus kind of sums it up pretty easily for us there. He says, hey, what do I need to do to do this thing called kingdom? He says, oh, just believe. Believe in me. Believe in Jesus that he is the bread of life. And everything else is going to follow, right? Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. It's seeking forth a new belief system that aligns with heaven. And everything else is going to happen as a result of what we believe. You know, I believe I'm hungry, and I know that I'm going to die if I don't eat, so then I eat. (laughs) Right? My behavior followed. Sometimes I believe muffins won't affect me as much as they do, so I eat them. Other times I believe they will, and I just don't care. And I eat them. Does that make sense? Our belief systems really dictate the way that we live life. And so we can really find out a lot about one another by asking questions about our beliefs. What does the Father think about you as a person, right? Does he love you? Is he waiting for you to change? Or did he provide the change from the foundation of the earth actually before he created you that by belief you can walk into? Did you know our righteousness was already established a long time ago? And now by belief, we get to enter into that righteousness and we renew our minds to be able to walk according to a truth that already pre-exists before our own consciousness. And so we learn how to believe who Jesus truly is and our walk is going to follow. Isn't that good news? Man, that is good news, the well church. Heal, restore, train, and send. That is so good. That as we believe in Jesus, we become transformed. Okay, so God's work is renewal of the mind, right? Because that's what belief is. The work of God is that we believe. The only way that we can believe is to renew our minds. Romans 12, 1 and 2 talks about this. About, he said, it says, don't be transformed by the world. Don't be conformed to the world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. That you may prove what is a good, perfect, and acceptable will of God. So that you, you be transformed by the renewing of your mind. You believe something different that you can prove the will of God in your life. Believe something different and you will show it throughout the way that you live your life. Here, let's turn real quick to John 14, 26. Jesus was so big on belief that he says, but the helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring to remembrance all things that I said to you. He's going to remind you. He's going to bring things to your mind on what truth is so that you don't actually respond to life based upon the way that you feel today, but he's going to remind you of the truth that Jesus spoke. And so what happens as we establish firm, firm, firm belief systems We are no longer dictated according to what the day brings, the emotions that we feel, the hurts that we have when we respond to truth. John 16, 13 talks about how when the spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all truth. Jesus made a really big deal about belief systems. He made a really big deal about, he said, I want to leave so that you have something even better behind Something that's actually going to live within you, come upon you, give you strength, and guide you into right thinking. I believe that this next revival that God is bringing is actually going to be such a renewing of the mind. How many people are in here are counselors or are going to school to be a counselor? Look at this. There's like 
10% of the room right now. I honestly, I can say in the last year of my life, I have met more people that are dealing with the mind than I've ever met in my entire life. Because God has a, is making an emphasis on the mind. He understands that we've done a really good job at setting up tasks on what to do and what not to do, but he's actually bringing a renewal of the mind. He's bringing a greater understanding of the mind so that we can conquer things in our mind and our actions are going to follow. If we want to bring Jesus to every single nation, we have to think right about Jesus. We have to learn to think the way that Jesus thinks and take on the mind of Christ. And so I really believe that God is establishing new realities in his kingdom. Every revival in the past has brought a new revelation of who God was. There were revivals all throughout the mid-century that that, uh, were bringing back, restoring the gifts of the Spirit. That healing still does exist. That praying in tongues, whatever it is, all these gifts were being awakened through all these little revivals that took place. Starting with Azusa Street. The second Pentecost came, and these new gifts are being rediscovered in the church. And then what happens in Toronto? The Toronto blessing is outpoured, and the Father's heart is seen for what it really is. There's this new reality that happens in our life. And knowledge of God then fuels our experiences of God, which then fuels our greater knowledge of who God is. And so there's new revelations that are always experienced when God pours out a spirit, because what does the spirit do? guides you into all truth, that you would believe in him, that you would believe in who Jesus really is. So revival is a greater outpouring of renewal of the mind. We get to see God in a new way, which then elevates our experience of who God is. When I found out that he's a good father, my experiences of who God was, my ability to receive him for who he truly was changed. The way that I started relating to the Father changed. And when I started experiencing him then, because of the knowledge that I had as a good father, my knowledge of who he was changed. And I got to see him in even a greater way. It's like the angels, when they look at the Lord, they say, holy, holy, holy. And then they have a new facet of his glory. And they say, holy, holy, holy. And a new facet of his glory is seen. And from now until all the end of the ages, they're going to be crying out, holy, holy, holy. Because their knowledge of him is changing. So their experience of God is changing. And our knowledge of God in this hour is changing. We're in a turning point. We're walking into a new season of what it looks like to live in the kingdom. And as our knowledge increases, our experiences increase. And as our experiences increase, our knowledge of who he is increases. It's like Paul said, I wish that, he, that your eyes of your understanding would be enlightened. Because as we can understand the ways of God, our mind is transformed into the image of Christ we can then walk in his ways in a greater capacity. Are you guys tracking with me on this? I know. God's work is a renewing of the mind. The revivals that he's bringing are going to bring greater renewal of our mind. Why that's about then what happens in transition. What happens as these new realities are attained? Because I don't know if you know this, but welcome to the well. You just entered into our family's transitional month. Every October, something happens. It doesn't matter if you want it to or not. It will happen. You're going to experience greater measures of his glory than you've ever experienced before. You're going to experience greater favor than you've ever experienced before. You're going to see more salvations than you've ever seen before. Because October is happening. And it happens every year. And it always increases. I remember the last October that was like big change was in words of knowledge. There was an October, all of a sudden, the Lord just increased his anointing for words of knowledge over this house. And that's when we started experiencing greater amounts of healing, physical healing in people's bodies. And I believe that the Lord is going to do the same in this October. This is going to be actually one of the greatest transitional months that we've ever experienced as a church. (laughs) He's actually taking us out of the wilderness and filling us with his glory in a greater way than we've ever experienced before. I'm telling you, this is going to be something so amazing, but we're going to have to make sure that we're looking, that our eyes are open and that we're able to see, right? Because the Bible even says that their minds are corrupted by the simplicity of the gospel. And sometimes things are right in front of us that are so simple that God is doing extraordinary things, but we need to magnify them. We need to make a big deal out of it. We need to make a real big deal out of it. 
It's like, oh, yeah, somebody got healed in my service. Do you know 50 years ago that didn't even happen? Right. 20 years ago that barely happened. Oh, yeah, five people got healed this week during worship. That is a big deal. That is a different reality breaking through into this reality. A different belief system manifesting itself in our lives. That belief system is that by Jesus' stripes you were healed, that he paid for your healing upon the cross. And so we then apply that truth into this reality. And in doing so, we remove ourselves from the emotions of this world and we respond only according to truth. That's what happens as we renew our mind. We walk in truth. We walk in the ways of the kingdom beyond what is in front of us until we see it. And we don't stop until it's in front of us, until we see it. So Revive Conference is coming. (laughs) That's exciting. But what I'm going to tell you is coming even sooner is I'm going to be on a plane in about 30 hours from now (laughs) and going to Bethel. I'm basically, if I'm not raptured in these next two weeks, I'm pretty sure there's no hope for me. Because I'm going to Bethel all week long, and then we're going to come back and we're going to have the Revive Conference the next week. And I'm sorry to say, but it's not just me. We're going to lose our whole worship team, our lead pastor, and Max and Thea. I'm sorry, guys. It's just what's going to happen in these next two weeks. We may float back into the sanctuary and just continue on through the portal. I would not be surprised if it, if it happened. I'd be like, yep, I was expecting this. But don't worry. I will look back and be like this. Should have gone to Reading. yep it's going to be cool it's going to be real cool if you're lucky we'll throw our mantles back down (laughs) oh man new realities our belief systems right That's what we're talking about here. Jesus sent the Holy Spirit. He says, hey, you want to know me? I'm actually going to go to the Father. I'm going to send the Holy Spirit that he will reveal himself, reveal me through him. The Holy Spirit points us to Christ. As we are pointed to Christ, Christ says, I am the picture of the Father. I am who the Father is. This is who the Father is. We get to the Father. He's like, hey, you want to know me? I I put myself in Jesus. Jesus. Jesus says, hey, you want to know me? I put myself in the Holy Spirit. There's this perfect unity between the three of them of this beautiful, beautiful, beautiful humility that they carried. Isn't that good? So we've got this transition coming. And we have to be aware of it and be aware of what happens in transition. One story that I could think of is Moses crossing over. And he says in Numbers 33, before Israel crossed over into Jordan, crossed over the Jordan into Canaan, he says to the Jews, demolish all their high places when we go in there. Take them all down, tear them up, rip them down to the ground. Otherwise, they're going to become as pricks in your eyes and as thorns in your side. See, we've got a mandate as we cross over. Let's turn real quick to 2 Corinthians 10, Four through five. It says, For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty in God, for pulling down strongholds, casting down arguments, and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God, bringing every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ. So we're real spiritual spiritual, wow, that was really hard to get out. Real spiritual warfare is believing in truth. The weapons of our warfare aren't carnal, but they're actually for tearing down strongholds, for tearing down everything that promotes itself above the knowledge of who God is. Everything that thinks differently than the knowledge of God. 
everything that tries to say that God is not real, he is not who he says he is, everything. So real spiritual warfare is believing in truth and pulling those things down in our mind and in the minds of those around us. And there's this reality that, that we need to be awakened to. See, we, we try to fight these external factors that really aren't the problem. Have you ever tried to fight really hard against sin? Like, really tried not to sin really hard. Let me do something. Don't think about the number 10. Right now, whatever you do, don't think about the number 10, no matter how many times I say 10 even. What number did I say? It's pretty hard not to do, right? It's kind of hard not to think about the number 10. Because the Bible actually says, submit to God, resist the devil, and he'll flee from you. Resistance without submission is really a hard thing. Submitting to God, believing in the truth, is what tears down the strongholds. Going to something, not just away from something. So we have heat and we have cold. Cold is the absence of heat. You can't get rid of cold by getting rid of cold. There is no such thing as getting rid of cold by taking cold away. Cold is a lie. It doesn't exist. It's the absence of something. Lies in our brain are the absence of truth. In order to get rid of the cold, you have to add heat to it. In order to tear down strongholds, you have to add truth to it. Does that make sense? Submit to God. Turn to somebody. Turn to a person, Jesus. Believe in his reality. And in doing so, you are resisting the devil. And so in transition, we walk into this new land, but all of a sudden there's new realities that we get to face. There's new strongholds, new belief systems that come up in our lives that we had no clue even existed. But they have to be dealt with. As we, as we tear, tear through new ground, let me, let me just give a quick example of something for my own life. I'm going to be real with you for a second. So... I, I'm young, obviously. I'm in my 20s. I am the senior associate pastor of a church. I own a business. I dropped out of college. I've got all these things that I'm doing that bring me in rooms with people that I feel more disqualified to be around than you could even believe. It is a temptation of mine. I walked in. Remember that story that I was like, I have one wife. I went to this room with all these pastors in the Kentwood area, and the mayor was there as well, and I am dead nervous. I am so nervous, and I don't know why I'm nervous. I can talk to a lot of people. It's fine, but I'm super nervous in this, and we're doing introductions, and it gets to me, and my palms are already like, I'm like filling up my water bottle. It was disgusting, and I'm dying inside, and I'm like, mom, mom. I'm dying right now. Like, I'm literally dying. And I started going under the table. And as I'm going under the table, they say, hey, are you dying? I say, yes, I'm dying. And so I finally was, she was able to pull me back out from under the table. And I get up, and I'm like, hey, my name is Matthew. This is my pastor of the Wild Church. Ah. <laughs> And I have one wife. And I just say, it's just the dumbest stuff. And I'm just like, oh my gosh. And I'm like, and here's my mom. Like, and I sat back down. And I sit back down. And I get home. And I'm like, what is going on? That was awkward. That was real awkward. And I experience these things all the time. Like, it just happens. And, and I, I start... Because there's new land, there's new promises, there's new parts of my destiny that the Lord is bringing me into. New relationships being established that he's ordained from the beginning of creation. There's things that he has for me. And as I'm walking into these new land, there's new realities that are coming up. And one of those is that I feel disqualified to lead because of my age and because of my experience educationally. And that's a reality that I had to face. I had to look at it head on. And I say, ah, man, I'm, so much, I'm honestly like half the age of everybody else in this room. And I, I have to face this reality. And this, these are things that it's, it's hard sometimes to tear down a stronghold, right? 
Because the truth was, is that God was the one that anointed and appointed me. The truth was, just as like David, that man looks at the outside of a person, looks at their age, looks at their background, and, and qualifies them according to their experience and in a number behind them. But God looks at the heart of man. And so I had to renew my mind into a truth. Is that, you know what? Yes, I don't have the experience that some people do or the knowledge that some people do. That's great. But I am called to where I am called. And I am who I am. And I had to resist the temptation to allow shame to cause me to hide. And give in to the temptation of, of disqualifying myself, the person that God said, this is where you belong. And so as I walked into new territory, there's these new lies that I have to tear down. And high places, they're, they're kind of high, you know. It's like, I don't know, it's crazy, they're high. Yeah, deep. And to walk up to high places, sometimes it, it's, it's a lot of work. There's lies in our mind that we believe sometimes that in order to tear them down, we've got to hike up the mountain. We've got to put the effort forth and tear that thing apart. We tear it apart with truth with belief in Jesus. Let's go to a king that figured this out. Josiah, 2 Kings 23. Okay, 2 Kings 23. Here we go. I always try to beat the media people, but they have a computer. Ha, gotcha. All right. Now the king sent them to gather all the elders of Judah and Jerusalem to him. Verse 1. The king went up to the house. That's why I got him. I didn't tell him the verse number. (laughs) The king went up to the house of the Lord with all the men of Judah and with him all the inhabitants of Jerusalem, the priests and the prophets and all the people, both small and great. And he read in their hearing all the words of the book of the covenant, which had been found in the house of the Lord. Then the king stood by a pillar and made a covenant before the Lord to follow the Lord and keep his commandments and his testimonies and his statutes. I'm going to turn to God. I'm going to do everything that he says, what he believes to be true. I am going to align myself up with that. With all of his heart he did this, and with all of his soul, to perform the words of his covenant that were written in this book, which is now written upon our hearts. And all the people took a stand for the covenant. And the king commanded Hilkiah, the high priest, the the priests of the second order, and the doorkeepers to bring out of the temple of the Lord all the articles that were made for Baal, for Asherah, and for all the hosts of heaven, and he burned them outside Jerusalem in the fields of Kidron and carried their ashes to Bethel. Then he removed the idolatrous priests whom the kings of Judah had ordained to burn incense on their high places in the cities of Judah. He removed those priests and in the pr- places all around Jerusalem and those who burned incense to Baal, to the sun, to the moon, to the constellations, and to all the hosts of heaven. He brought down all the wooden images. Man, this guy had a mission. He's just tearing things apart. He's taking people out of place that, were me- that could be there to rebuild even. Not only is he tearing things down, he's actually removing people out of their position. He said, I'm not just going to tear down the thing that you believe, but I'm actually going to take away every influence of that belief. Then he tore down the ritual booths of the perverted persons that were in the house of the Lord where the women were hanging the wooden images. If you get the idea, the guy's just tearing things down. And what the Lord is, is asking us to this reality that we have is that we are in war. The success of this war is correlated with our belief that it actually exists. And oftentimes, we, we allow ourselves to be filled with things that are establishing strongholds in our mind. We're, we're, we're allowing things to, to poison our mind that, the, that high places are built up in our minds of lies that are bringing themselves against the knowledge of God. And so what the Lord is doing is he's tearing down these strongholds in our minds, and we have to partner with him in order to do it. We have to believe in his truth, and we have to be brave enough to, to hike the mountain. You guys all know those things, right? That we have these different insecurities and stuff. This insecurity for me is a mountain that I had to hike. I had to not skip the next meeting. I had to go. I had to shake people's hands. I had to believe I am a chosen son. I am called by him. And above all else, that's my identity. I am all for education. I'm, I, I love, I value people's experiences. Absolutely. 
as we all should. But I am a child of the king. And that's the only way that I can relate to people, is as a child of the king. And so we're going to walk into transition. We're in a transitional month, and there's going to be new things that come up. This is just a reality, because we're in a war over our minds. The devil is doing a real good job discipling the nations through the media, a lot through the media, through schools, through all these different ways that lies are being built up against the knowledge of God. And our evangelism will look a lot different as we focus on people's beliefs instead of just their behaviors. So what are we going to do then? It opens us up to be able to love in ways that tear down strongholds in people's minds. That the, all the lies that are built up about what Christianity is and isn't, we get the opportunity to invite them into a kingdom that will change the way that they think. You know, the Holy Spirit, all throughout Acts, he was displayed. He brought healing to people. And what would happen afterwards, they believed. A demonstration of the kingdom brings people into right belief. Paul said, I did not come to you with just persuasive words of men's wisdom, but of demonstration of the spirit and of power. You can tell me that you love me, but show me as well. My mom could tell me my entire life, I love you, I love you, I love you, and doing something else, I, I really wouldn't believe her unless I experience the demonstration that she has given me. And so God is going to release an ability to demonstrate his kingdom, his truths, to a world of unbelievers and bring them into belief. Isn't that exciting? There's walls torn down then through that. We don't need to focus on the way people act so much as we do on their belief systems. Their actions will follow. If you're struggling against sin, if you're struggling against hurts and stuff, focus on receiving the love and the grace from Jesus, the faith, the righteousness that can only come from him. As you believe in who he is, I'm telling you it's going to disappear. I promise you it'll disappear. All right, I'm going to pray for you guys. Does this all make sense? I apologize. I didn't have my phone up here. I'm not even sure what time it is, so I'm just going to pray. All right, 12.05. Good. <clears throat> Great. <laughs> All right, just enough time that people will be done eating by the time you get to lunch, and the restaurant will be clear. You're welcome. <laughs> yes, you're welcome. <clears throat> Father, I thank you for the new realities that you are releasing. Every time you bring a revival, God, every time as you pour out your spirit, he guides us into greater truth. We believe things today that were not even heard of. 50, 60 years ago, not even heard of 10 years ago, five years ago, even yesterday. You're constantly renewing our mind into the image of your son. And Jesus, we lift you up in this place. You say that you are the only way. You are truth. And you are renewing us into who you are. We thank you for it, God. And so we take the offensive walking into this season. Then when lies try to come up, we establish our own strongholds, our own core values of truth. We thank you, Lord, for what you're doing in this community, God. I'm honored to be able to be a part of it. I thank you for bringing blessing to every person that goes throughout their week today. Let your truth shine bright in our hearts and we understand who you are and respond to your love. We thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen.